My mother in the 1950s uh, and early 1960s used to do voluntary work to support the Hospital of St. John of God in Yorkshire, where I grew up in, in England. And uh, it's fascinating to be here today to see this hospital of the same name completely transformed with, um, I imagine, what you would call a new charism, a new approach to thinking about your work here in this uh, fabulous modern setting. So it's, uh, it's a connection for me with my origins and something new to experience here uh, at this hospital. So welcome to the day. Um, I'm the director of this day, I discovered. Um, I got to sign the certificates. Uh, it, it helped a lot, actually, because I, I charged five euros for each signature. <laughs> and a hundred people, uh, that's not bad. That, that will buy my pink thus for tonight and tomorrow. So um, here we are. Um, now, originally, this lecture had three parts. These were them, three elements. Um, but uh, life got in the way a little bit. I, I don't know if you know the expression of uh, John Lennon of the Beatles. I saw that there's a Beatles concert here next week, 50 years anniversary of the Beatles. John Lennon said many things, but one of them was about life. He said, life is what happens when you're making other plans. And uh, so this is kind of what happened to me. I was thinking about plans and uh, thinking about Sicily's life. And I thought I could cover three things, but I can't. Um, the person and the contribution we'll have to talk about during the day. And I decided to talk mainly about the archive and I mean this in a very broad sense of what do we know about Cicely Saunders? What um, materials do we have to draw on to make sense of her life? Uh, so I wanted to really tell you the story of how that archive had been in formation over a period of time and what it looks like today. That's a lovely picture of Cicely that I, I only obtained recently, um, taken... I think in Cornwall, in, in the south of England. So when we think about this archive of Sicily's life, um, what, what do we have available? We know things that we've been told already in the introduction, that she was uh, a nurse, she was a social worker, she was a doctor. I always like to say that before any of those, she was a social scientist. She studied um, philosophy, uh, politics and economics at Oxford University. Um, we know these things about the elements of her life and some of uh, her contribution is well known and will be talked about in detail today. Um, and surrounding that now, there is uh, 10 years on from her death, uh, there is a huge amount of material that we can continue to draw on uh, to make sense of that life. Uh, so I wanted to take you through um, this material, these sources, uh, and to talk a little bit about how they came to be generated and brought together and what potential they might have for future scholarship. Really, the, the archive, I've, I've said here, was in formation in this decade, 1995 to 2005. Um, that was the point when I became interested in collating this material and, and, and ensuring that things that she had uh, didn't get lost. Um, but it's quite clear that the archive had been in formation for much longer than that. And from, even from the late 1950s, Cicely Saunders was carefully preserving things, which I think even then she sensed would be of historical importance. Um, in one of her letters, she actually said to a friend, we're going to need an archivist one day to make sense of this. Uh, and that was in 1960. Um, so the archive had been in formation over a longer period, but it starts to come together more formally from the mid-1990s. This is just a little example of the kinds of things that uh, you find in, the, in this archive. This is a little pain chart that Cicely had written when she was uh, at um, St. Joseph's Hospice in the East End of London in, in the late 1950s. But for me, the story begins in 1994, because I... I 
was getting interested in the history of the hospice movement in Britain. And I was aware that um, there are a number of people who contributed to that history who were getting older. Um, some of them were re re retiring and uh, moving out of the field. Uh, and I had the idea that we could um, try and capture some of their stories on interview. And um, today we have a large Welcome Trust grant and some of my colleagues are here with me from, from our team in Glasgow. Um, but at that time I applied to the Welcome Trust for a very small grant to help us to do some interviews with uh, key people who'd been involved in the formation of hospice in uh, Britain. We, we thought there would may maybe be 20 interviews to be done. Well, over the years we've done many interviews and we now have a, a collection of uh, interviews with people from all around the world, including several from Spain, who've been involved in the history of palliative care. Um, so today the, 20, the original 20 interviews has become more than 800 interviews uh, with some of the key people all around the world who've contributed to this field. But when I had this idea, I, I, I got in touch with Cicely Saunders and asked her if she would kind of give me an endorsement to maybe help the Wellcome Trust look on me favorably when I applied for a small amount of money to them. And she wrote this very kind letter uh, saying how pleased she was that I was taking an interest in uh, the history and that there were things that she could help me with, not just by talking to me, but by guiding me towards her papers and at that time, I didn't realize that there was this big collection of papers uh, that she had preserved at St. Christopher's. Um, so um, it soon became clear that there was a lot more to this than just a small number of interviews. And this is what we found in the basement of St. Christopher's in 1995, when Cicely said, oh, go down and have a look and see what you can find among my old papers. And this is what we found. It was a bit of a mess. Um, even more worrying, um, somebody said, oh, um, they're in the basement, but um, we get a lot of rain here in the summer. The, this was England, remember. So we get a lot of rain in the summer. Um, and sometimes the basement floods. So we, at this point, kind of panicked and said, well, we must do something about this. And um, these are the kinds of conditions in which the heritage of the international hospice movement, the papers of Cicely Saunders, were located in 1995. And nobody seemed to think this was a problem, apart from me. So I said, we must do something. Um, and we had the idea that we could try to archive the material in a more formal way. And so I went to the, um, I don't want to push a button that makes things go wrong, the Halley Stewart Trust. <clears throat> Does anyone know that name, the Halley Stewart Trust? It, <clears throat> it was the first um, philanthropic trust that gave a grant to Cicely Saunders in 1958 <clears throat> to support her work at St. Joseph's. So I went back and said, look, you supported her then, this huge contribution has been made in the years following. Uh, and now we have this challenge of her papers and materials. Can you help? Well, they gave us a grant and we were able for one year to employ an archivist who uh, was able to work on the papers. Uh, and we began to think about what the potential of this was. And the first thing we did was we removed some of the papers from the basement of St. Christopher's to the university where I worked at that time uh, in Sheffield. But we, we only removed, I thought we'd removed quite a lot of the large percentage of the papers, but as you'll learn later on, it wasn't such a big percentage. Um, because Cicely said, well, there are things that I'm still working on in, in my office and I don't want those to go away, they're, they're still active. Um, so just take these things from the basement and uh, uh, those are things I'm not using anymore. Well, it, it led to um, uh, us producing 60 boxes like this uh, of archive material, 6060. Uh, and, and for a number of years I was fortunate to have these right next to me, first in one university in Sheffield and then in Lancaster. 
And when I first met Martina Holder, um, was in Lancaster, and she was able to come and sit in this room. She was reminding me of it last night, the room with no window, but 60 boxes of Cicely Saunders papers. And, and this proved to be a really rich resource to work on uh, at that time. Uh, and so I started to get a, a sense uh, of the, the scope of all this and what could be done with it. And one of the things that interested me was um, to try to produce a, a bibliography uh, of Cicely's publications, because in the files we found lots of examples of her early publications. On her curriculum vitae, at that, uh, the, which she gave me at that time, um, for the years 1958 to 1967, when, uh, when St. Christopher's opened, um, there were six publications on the CV. But I quickly realized that she had written far more than this. And I think now we've found for that decade, before St. Christopher's opened, from the first publication in 1958 to the opening of the doors of St. Christopher's in July 1967, over 60 publications were written in that decade. So when people say to you, 1967 was the start of the hospice movement, I now say, well, it was the end of the first phase of its development because there had been this very active period of 10 years in which she'd been forming her ideas, raising money, learning about end-of-life issues, and gathering the enthusiasms of others. Uh, and that involved a lot of writing and publication. So the, the bibliography was important. And we started to um, try to put it together, but also to annotate it so that in these two publications that appeared in Palliative Medicine, you not only get the references, but you get a summary of each paper. Um, and that really is still a work in progress. I haven't finished that yet. But currently, we think there are 226 public lifetime publications of Cicely Saunders. And this is books, articles. Some of them are fairly short things. Some of them are very substantial. Some of them appeared in uh, non-specialist journals, somewhere in the Oxford Textbook of Palliative Medicine. Very wide-ranging. Uh, set of publications. And um, a few years ago, a student of mine uh, looked at these um, with a particular interest in the papers that had significant content that related to religious and spiritual issues. And she produced um, this uh, very interesting uh, bar chart. When I was telling my wife about the bar chart, she said, oh, I assume that all of the religious papers were at the beginning of Sicily's career. Um, and later on, they became more medical and technical. And I said, that's what I'd assumed as well, but we're both wrong. Um, because it's the red ones that are the 50 key texts where she is really concentrating on religious and spiritual issues in those writings. And as you can see, they occur right through her publication lifetime. And this is what Martina will explain in more detail, the significance of that thinking, that work, those influences. Um, but these are some examples of what you can start to do when you regard Cicely Saunders not just as the founder of the hospice movement, but as a set of research questions to be explored and answered, uh, which will illuminate our understanding of hospice. Uh, in palliative care and its history. So w what I'd started to do at this time from 1995 onwards with a number of colleagues at the University of Sheffield and later at Lancaster was to write about things that we could understand and learn from these 60 archive boxes, particularly from the early period. And of course it was during that early period that she'd formed the concept of total pain Pain is something which is not only physical, but is psychological, social, has spiritual and religious uh, dimensions. And I, I got very interested in, if you like, the archaeology of the concept. I quickly discovered that all of the references in the palliative care literature uh, to the original concept of total pain were wrong. The, uh, if you look in the Oxford textbook, the first edition, 1993, it says Cicely Saunders first wrote about total pain in. Well, if you go to that article, it doesn't actually refer to total pain. Um, 
The concept began much earlier and was articulated over a number of different papers from 1965 onwards. And I, I tried to explain that in, in this paper, mining deeper into what she was doing, what she was thinking. And in this particular instance, uh, trying to um, um, uh, connect it to some ideas of a more philosophical nature from the work of uh, Michel Foucault, the, the notion of disciplinary power and the power of a concept, uh, in this case of total pain. And, and we found that this was quite a, a fruitful line of inquiry and people got interested in it. And, and, and in this period, uh, I had to check back yesterday, but about 35 publications came out from myself and colleagues in which we were digging deeper into this history and in particular looking at the contribution uh, of Cicely Saunders. So this kind of boosted my confidence that there was interest in this work. And as we looked more carefully at the papers, we realized that one of the key features of these 60 archive boxes was an enormous number of letters that had been written from the late 1950s onwards uh, to people all around the world. Over time, people who were corresponding with Sicily uh, about her work and about their ideas and ambitions. Enrique was saying at dinner last night about writing to Sicily and to, to his amazement, getting a reply. She was a wonderful correspondent. She cared about letters that came to her. She was respectful of those who wrote. She tried to respond and be helpful. And this led to a, a massive number of, of letters. So one day I, I said to Cicely, look, you know, these letters, when you, have you read any of them recently? Well, she said, of course not. Why would I read my own letters? Uh, I said, well, they are very, very interesting, and they tell their own story about your work and your life. Nobody would possibly be interested in that, she said. So I said, well, I think they would be. And we came up with the idea of editing her letters into a book for Oxford University Press. And uh, again, yesterday I was looking up to see if anyone had reviewed the book, and I was delighted to see there had been some reviews which I'd forgotten about. This one was a rather nice one, so I thought I would quote it. From the uh, Journal of the Royal Society of Medicine, it said that you, know, you approach a, a set of selected letters uh, written by any person with a bit of caution and uh, maybe a bit of doubt. But um, I thought I'd quote this. Clark's scrupulous approach. This, this was my attempt not just to pull out letters that would be interesting and exciting, but to try and select them in a careful way that would tell a story and that would be balanced in terms of the people she was writing to. The curious thing about my approach was that these are only the letters she wrote, not the replies or the letters that were written to her. So my idea of doing that was really that it was almost like reading somebody's diary. It's the, the letters are in a single voice of, of one person um, over uh, a long period of time, from 1959 to 1999. Um, so that's what we did, and uh, Oxford University uh, published the book. And this was some of the process that was involved. I think I read about 7,000 letters from that period. Uh, and from that, uh, I, I made a selection of about 1,000. And. Uh, my eldest daughter, who was a teenager at that time, needed pocket money. So I, um, as I selected the 1,000 letters, I put a little yellow tag on the letter. And then my daughter's job was to very carefully photocopy it. Uh, and then we were able to put, do something that hadn't been done before, was we put the letters into chronological order, put them all together to see what it looked like, 1,000 letters. Well, as I'll explain in a moment, further work has been done in the last year on Sicily's archive. And we've been, uh, Katrina and myself, have been in contact with the archivist in London. And he said to me, when we went through the papers, that a lot of them have got these yellow post-it tags on, and we can't figure out what these are. Why, why did she put these tags on? And I said, oh, well, that was actually me <laughs> uh, to guide my daughter to the ones that she had to photocopy. Um, so that's what we did, and when you put a thousand of the letters, you see, imagine they're in lots of different boxes. You select a thousand, and then you put them in date order. You see what I mean? You then 8th of March, 20th of March, 
year by year. You build up this remarkable storyline. So from that, I then selected um, what turned out to be 566 letters uh, which appeared in the book. And they were with 340 different people um, with a worldwide range. And you know, over the years, I spent time with doctors. I know you, even when you're talking about history and philosophy and religion, you have to have a bar chart somewhere. Uh, so this was one showing the, these 566 letters, the different parts of the world uh, with which she was corresponding with different people. And you see this worldwide range there uh, in her work um, in, and through those letters. And then I tried to enhance the letters with a lot of footnotes that explained who some of the people were and why she was writing and responding in the way that she did. So this was really establishing, for me, it was like establishing base camp of Everest. We've got the letters, we've looked at them, we've published them, there's something, that's a contribution. That, that is getting things out of that basement where they're in danger of turning into papier mache uh, and getting them into a permanent form that others can read into the future. Um, so that was a, an important uh, piece. And Cicely was then very pleased and surprised and delighted. Um, so we continued to think about things. And um, around, the book came out in 2002. And uh, around that time, Cicely gave uh, a lecture in uh, Westminster Cathedral, uh, a short lecture about aspects of her life and the, the influence of religion upon her work. And she sent it to me, it was just a few pages, and she said, um, do you think that this could be published in some form? And I, I read it with great interest, but I didn't really see how you would publish it on its own. So I began to think, well, did she write other things like this uh, at earlier periods. And um, so I started to dig back and look more carefully for publications where she was addressing the influence of religion and, and spirituality, um, not just on her work, but on her life and the development of her life and her career. And um, to my surprise, I found that there were a number of these articles that sort of had this kind of theme. What, what I didn't expect was that when we found a small number of them, that there would be one from the 1950s, one from the 1960s, uh, one from the 70s, 80s, and then one from the 90s. So we put them together and, and had a look at them. And they seemed to go together uh, as a set of little essays. And um, so we thought, well, look, this could make an interesting little book, but who would publish it? Well, who would? So then I thought, well, nowadays it's easy to become a publisher. So I set up my own publishing company, and, and we published the book. Um, a thousand copies were published and sold, five pounds each. Um, Enrico Benito, Enrique Benito has got one of the original ones, signed by Sicily. Um, and then we published them again. And nowadays, you can just view it on the internet. It's there as a PDF. Um, but it, it proved to be of great interest, and people enjoyed it and liked it. And again, Sicily was very happy, and it, it was a cottage industry. The, the photograph I, was one I took. It's not such a great picture, really. It's out of focus. But um, it was taken in the field at the back of my house, and Sicily said she liked it because it wasn't clear whether the sun was rising or setting, and, and that was a kind of nice image. Uh, and as Martina will explain more, we called it Watch With Me. Um, what we didn't expect at that point was all of these things to happen. Um, so first of all, uh, Augusto Carasini in, in uh, Milano uh, says, well, I think we should translate it into Italian. Um, and then Martina, uh, um, the next year, into German. Uh, and then <coughs> these distinguished people um, some of whom are present today into Spanish. And then these wonderful people from Portugal who are also here today uh, into uh, Portuguese. So the little book that started out as just this one essay that you couldn't really publish uh, becomes five essays now in uh, five different editions and, and, and uh, different languages. 
um, with possibly others in the pipeline. Everyone keeps saying, why is there not a French edition? We think there might, in the next year or so, be a Polish one. Uh, and it's possible there could be a Korean one as a result of Martina's work. So the book continues to get interest and uh, has a lot of life and uh, vitality about it. And Cicely was very, very pleased with that. So that was another something established that we thought was, was worthwhile. Um, after Cicely died in, and at her memorial service uh, in uh, Westminster Abbey on the 8th of March 2006, um, Robert Twycross gave the eulogy and he began by saying, um, you, you will have probably read Cicely Saunders' uh, um, uh, biography written by Shirley de Boulay, but do you know her autobiography? Well, there are a lot of people in the church that day who knew that Cicely Saunders had never written an autobiography. So they were looking around a bit puzzled and Twycross had paused for dramatic effect and we were all saying, what does he mean? And then, to my delight, he described this as her autobiography. And I think that's a really very, very touching and poignant notion that um, this little collection, Watch With Me, really sums up her life, as he puts it, um, recounts the salient points on her pilgrimage through life and tells again the constant inspiration uh, of her faith. Um, so this, this little collection, I think, is capturing that in a very important way. Um, and Cicely was pleased that we'd done it and, and um, was able to give people copies and uh, the year it was published that was her Christmas present to uh, all of her friends. So I, I was emboldened by this, I thought well there are things here that are worth doing and uh, we've done the letters, we've done the little collection of, book, of, of papers, watch with me. What about a bigger book that has her selected writings, we've selected letters Selected writings. Oh, no, 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 no. Nobody would be interested in uh, my selected writings, she said. And I said, well, look, they're interested in your letters. They're interested in Watch With Me. Why not a bigger book that has more of the medical, the, uh, the technical uh, publications in, some of which are very, very hard to obtain. Uh, for example, uh, we started the book with um, her first publication, which was written be inspired by this uh, student here today. When she was a medical student, her first publication was published in the St. Thomas's Hospital Gazette, a paper called um, Dying of Cancer. And that was the first paper that we put in the book. It was very, very hard to get hold of that paper, so it was wonderful to have it in the book now where people can access it more easily. And if you read it, it's a manifesto for everything that happened in the next 40 or 50 years. Uh, it's called Dying of Cancer, but uh, at the end of the, uh, the, the piece, it has a whole section on the challenges of caring for people with non-malignant disease at the end of life. Uh, the challenges that we're now facing globally uh, when we think about making end, good end-of-life care, palliative care available to everyone who can benefit from it. Um, so we did this, and I, I, was, I was fond of... Uh, in my jokey way of calling it Cicely Saunders' Greatest Hits. I'm afraid this was a joke she never, ever got. However often I repeated it, she never, ever laughed at it. But I'm, I'm pleased that some people here get the joke. Um, but that's what I like to call it. This is your greatest hits, Cicely, you know, your best tracks, your, uh, the ones that you, you're really proud of. Um, so this was, I, I think, became a key reference work for us. Um, with a lot of hard to access publications. And uh, just at the moment, um, there's uh, a Japanese palliative medicine doctor who's working on a Japanese version uh, of the selected writings. He's had to reduce the number a little bit from the, um, the 44 that we have. Um, but um, he is wanting to call it in Japanese, which I can't tell you. Uh, he wants to call it the greatest hits. <laughs> so maybe uh, it will appear on the cover. Uh, so a lot of interest in that. The, the sad thing for this was that um, we were working on this through 2005. 
and um, Cicely was very, very keen to see the book, but she was becoming ill at this point, and she was now a patient in St. Christopher's. And uh, she had been planning to give this book to people for Christmas, um, but of course she died in July of 2005, and, and she, she didn't see the book. Um, but on the last day I saw her in June of 2005, I'd been able to obtain um, a photocopy of the cover so she saw the cover, uh, and she, you know, we'd chosen the photograph together, and it echoes the, the style of the other book of letters. Uh, and so she was able to see that, though she never held the book uh, in her hands. Uh, she, she saw that it was very close to uh, being published. And as you know, she, she, she died um, on the 14th of July, 2005. So. This year, we've been marking the 10th anniversary of Cicely's death. And I think, for me, what has um, been important in, in thinking back to Cicely's work and her life has been the importance that we recognized in 1995, 10 years before. So I was fortunate to know Cicely for the last decade of her life, that we were able to do quite a lot of work to preserve the legacy. I mean. I don't know, you, you know, there is this kind of what if history, what if we hadn't gone into the basement, we hadn't realized what was there, it had been flooded the next summer, S somebody had just put it all in a skip, it could have happened, it does happen. So we're very pleased that didn't happen and we were able to start to work from 1995 over 10 years to preserve the legacy in ways that Sicily could be involved in and knew about and contributed to. And that's why it's so special now to record what, what's, what's been going on uh, more recently. Because after Sicily died, uh, she, um, in her will, she said that all of her archive and materials should go to the archive of King's College London. Uh, which is the university that houses the Cicely Saunders Institute, led by Professor Irene Higginson. Um, so we knew that everything would go there. I knew that the day would come when I would have to part with my precious 60 boxes that I'd had next to me for seven or eight years. Um, but what I didn't know was uh, what else was going there and how much there would be, because there was a lot more at St. Christopher's that Cicely had said, oh, don't archive that. In 1995, she said, I still need this. There was also the things that were in her house and other things that the Saunders family had. Uh, so the decision was taken to give it all, almost all of it, to the archive in King's College, London. It's right in the middle of London if you're going to visit it. It's in the Strand. Um, in a very nice part of London. So it's, if you have a reason to go to London, and it's in the middle of London, you can go and visit the archive. And um, I was in touch just over the last few days with the archivist who has been working on bringing this collection, the full collection, together in the last year. And again, we must salute our funder. The Wellcome Trust has funded his work for the last year. But now we have 230 of these boxes I had 60 and I thought that was a treasure trove. So uh, there is now 230 boxes and 1,200 files within them. A huge collection of material. And it's summarized here, all of the things from her early life, personal family life. It includes her personal diaries as well as her work diaries, her prayer diaries. Uh, but in addition to the papers and documents, a lot of photographs Slides, 35-millimeter um, slides. She was using those from the early 60s. Um, Audiovisual recordings of various kinds, honors, awards, and various kinds of memorabilia. So it's a rich treasure trove uh, of material. And um, Christopher Olver, who is the archivist that's been working on it, um, has been writing a blog where he describes the work. Uh, you can follow it here. Um, uh, explaining how he's been putting the archive together and trying to make it more accessible to a wider audience. There are little things in the blog which you might enjoy, like um, there's a, a, an interactive uh, piece that shows her visit to America in 1963 where you can follow 
her journey across the map of the United States and things like that. Um, but one of the things he put on the blog recently was this. You, you can't see it too well there. Um, nowadays we call this a mind map, I think. Um, but this was the origins of total pain, body and mind. All of these dimensions in Sisley's own hand. These are the kind of riches that you can find now uh, in the archive of uh, King's College London. Uh, all brought together in 230 boxes. So if you want to go to London for your holidays, maybe take a, an afternoon out and go and look at the archive. It's freely accessible to anyone. In addition to what's in the archive, though, and this is something I'm particularly interested in, there's a lot of other material about Sicily available to us. Um, there are a lot of publicly available sound recordings for example, um, we have on the BBC Radio in Britain a, a program that's run for 50 or 60 years. It's called Desert Island Discs. And they invite some celebrity in and say, we're, we're going to put you on an, a desert island all on your own. You're going to be a castaway. Your ship was wrecked and you're the only person on the island. And you have to choose eight records, pieces of music, to take with you to the island. Uh, the format has never changed in 50 years of this program, but it's very, very popular. So for example, Cicely was, uh, she was one of the castaways on Desert Island Discs some years ago, uh, and you can listen to her choice of uh, eight pieces of music. That's on the BBC iPlayer. Uh, we've linked to it on our SoundCloud. But there are many other examples like that of, uh, of material <coughs> where you can listen to Cicely or, or watch her on video. Um, and I, I think this needs collating. At the moment, uh, there's, no, uh, there's no finding aid to direct you towards all of this, but there's a huge amount of material. It's not in the archive, it's out there. Um, so that needs to be uh, explored. And I was fortunate as well, in the last three or four years of her life, um, to conduct a lot of private interviews with Sicily uh, in anticipation of writing a biography after her death. Um, uh, so the idea of those interviews was that she would, could be more candid and, and reflective than she might be when doing something, for example, on the BBC. Um, and I have about 20 interviews with her uh, done on that basis. So there's a lot of uh, interview material of various kinds about, uh, uh, from Sicily that we, we need to pull together and, and collate in some way. There's also a huge amount of writing about Sicily, and this needs to be identified and, and catalogued. Some of it's in newspapers and magazines and book chapters. Um, the, a former Prime Minister of the United Kingdom, Gordon Brown, uh, wrote a book um, in which he had a chapter on Sicily. A lot of people have written about Sicily in, in different ways. Um, and there is, of course, a biography that was published in 1984 by Shirley de Boulay and was updated a few years after Sicily died uh, in 2007. And there are some student dissertations written about Sicily uh, and unpublished material of various kinds, which again, I think we need to catalog and, and collate so we have a sense of this uh, collection uh, as a whole. Um, that's just one little example, a newspaper article from the independent newspaper in Britain. There are many of these, but we don't have a full list of them at the moment. So where next with all this? Um, I think there's a huge amount still to be understood about the life of Sicily. We're going to be spending the whole day today exploring that with a particular emphasis on the religious and the spiritual. Um, and what I think we can now say with some confidence is that we've gathered together a lot of the material that makes it possible to explore those questions through Sicily's own writings, through her correspondence and documents, through all of the trappings and ephemera around her life, the recordings, the interviews, the things written uh, about her. So for our own part, um, Katrina, who's at the back here filming the, today, is making a short film about Sicily. There are not too many films about, them, uh, about Sicily, although one appeared in Germany in 1974, Martina, was it 74? 73. 73. Um, 
Martina has a copy of it. It's a bit of a, a gem, probably worth a large amount of money on the black market. Um, the, the, but there are not very many films about Sicily, and we think it would be uh, nice to make a short film that would make her life and work accessible to a wider audience. And for me, the big thing is this. Um, I, I envisaged when we put together the letters and the selected writings that there would be a third volume, and the third volume would be a new biography. And that's what I promised Sicily I would do. It feels like quite a weight sitting on my shoulders. Um, it's 10 years now since she died, and I have to start making some progress in this direction. So I'm planning during next year, uh, 2016, to, to make a start on this. Uh, I think it's time for a full reappraisal of Cicely's life and work. Maybe 10 years after her death is a good time to be starting to think about it. Until now, it was too close. Um, so this is something that I, I hope to complete over the next few years uh, as a, to make up a trilogy of the letters, the selected writings, uh, and a, a new biography. But I think it's clear from the interest today and other events we've had, for example in Zurich a few years ago, that her contribution and her legacy are of interest to people. But my point is they also require attention and support. We've gone a long way. We now have the full archive in King's College London, but there's still a lot more material about Sicily uh, that we could gather together uh, and, and preserve uh, uh, for the future. And for me, it's worth doing that, because as we learn as the day goes on today, this was a remarkable person, probably one of the most remarkable figures um, of the 20th century, who said to somebody in St. Christopher's, just a few days before she died, I've been a nurse, I've been a social worker, I've been a doctor, but the hardest thing of all is learning to be a patient. Thank you very much.